All right, so let's talk about hearing disorders. Um, well, the way that I'm going to start this is by saying if you are my age or older, you probably remember the weekly world news. Um, and this is so the I, <laughs> weekly world news is like it's not the onion because it never officially told anybody that it was fake but you know it it totally was fake like it's but <clears throat> but i think some people thought it was real like you know like mm, i don't know the people that thought it was real were pretty like out there but as a kid i used to like to pick these up um when i was in the like waiting with my parents in line to uh, pay for groceries so i'd like read through these and um, see what kind of crazy stuff there was. This is one thing they came up with was this um, Bat Boy. Um, and his ears, you can see here, that scientists say his ears are better than radar. Well, what's interesting is, um, if this kid was real, he'd be about 28 today, so... Ladies... Um, but he probably would, this would probably be classified as a, as a hearing disorder. Um, so very intense hearing is just as much of a disorder, uh, as, uh, an intense, um, intensely diminished hearing is. Of course, nobody has hearing like this. If somebody does have really, um, sensitive hearing, it's, uh, it's unusual. I'm not going to say it's not a true thing. Their ears probably don't look like this. And God, I hope their teeth don't look like that. But um, if someone did have something like that, that would be considered a hearing disorder. And there are some uh, hearing disorders that we're not totally going to focus on because we're just kind of going through the main types of hearing disorder. But there's things like uh, central auditory processing disorder, which isn't um, like kind of the physical and uh, neural, it is a neural disorder, but not exactly the same kind of neural disorder that we're going to be talking about today. Um, so there are others, um, and in some cases, uh, things like misophonia, which might be a little bit closer to ultra-sensitive hearing, uh, are also other types of hearing disorders. Um, if you want to know more about those, of course, you can email me. Um, so of course, like I'm saying, if this dude was real, this would probably be a hearing disorder because can you imagine, um, trying to find an apartment, uh, a 28 year old salary that is far enough away from traffic noise that you could sleep? It's ridiculous. Uh, it just wouldn't, it wouldn't work. Um, and then also I was thinking like, well, he's old enough that he could be in like movies. I mean, he's not Robert Pattinson, but close enough. I think. I'm sure you'd all agree. He'd fit for like a, in a pinch. Okay. So let's do a quick quiz for absolutely no points. Um, especially because I won't really be able to hear your answers. But I will have you enter an answer for one of these as your word of the week. Um, there are three major sections of the auditory system. This is not your word of the week. I just want you to think about what's in each major section. Well, first, what are the major sections? Outer ear, middle ear, and inner ear. Good. And the outer ear is mostly just the pinna and the auditory, uh, the external auditory meatus or the auditory canal. Uh, the middle ear is where you've got your eardrum or tympanic membrane. The ossicles are in there as well. And then the inner ear is going to be where you have uh, your cochlea and your hair cells and everything that goes along with those as well, like the basilar membrane, the tectorial membrane, etc. What is the coiled structure, like uh, the poop emoji structure? This is your word of the week. What is that structure called? It's the cochlea, right? And what's in it? Well, the hair cells are the most important thing in the cochlea. There's a lot of important stuff in the cochlea, and it all works together 
basilar membrane, tectorial membrane, um, Meissner, or not Meissner cells. Oh man, organ of Corti is in there as well. Meissner cells are for touch. I don't know where that came from. Um, and of course the hair cells, the inner hair cells and the outer hair cells. There's three rows of, inner, of outer hair cells and one row of inner hair cells. Um, and those are the main transducers between um, the waves, which are not necessarily sound pressure waves by the time they reach the hair cells, but they are still waves, and the neural impulse, which is going to travel to the brain. Um, so again, your word of the week is cochlea. And then where is Heschel's gyrus? Well, it's in the brain, and it is the primary auditory cortex, another name for the primary auditory cortex. Um, it's in the superior temporal gyrus, and that just means that it's in the temporal lobe. Uh, the superior gyrus, the gyrus is kind of like a valley. A sulcus is a, like a... Sorry. <laughs> oh, man. It's a little late when I'm recording this. Sorry. A gyrus is like a hill. And a sulcus is like a valley. So essentially what this is saying is that in the temporal lobe, it's on the uppermost, the topmost hill, the superior temporal gyrus. Uh, and that's where Heschel's gyrus, or the primary auditory cortex, would be. Okay. Um, so let us talk about normal hearing. So we mentioned this. I mentioned this um, earlier. Was there something I wanted to... No, there's nothing else I want to talk about on that one. I mentioned this last time, but our range of hearing is from 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. And like I said, that's the range, the possible range. It's really unusual that um, you would have somebody that can hear 20 hertz and 20,000 hertz. Um, one of the things that I've included in the module is a test. It's just a YouTube video. You can test yourself on you know, how far up you can hear. It's not super well controlled um, because the volume of your um, computer, whatever you listen to it with, uh, is going to be, you know, that'll have something to say about how well you can hear it. Also, the actual speakers that you're listening through will also kind of change how well you can do. But um, I did it with some other people a few semesters ago, and we topped out at different places. Um, so then we could definitely test where the hearing was, uh, where our hearing was. In fact, one of the people topped out quite early and they were like, I think it stopped. And, you know, we're like, no, we can still hear it. And so it's, it's kind of interesting to see where your uh, hearing tops out. Um, and it can also be kind of depressing. <laughs> it was, it was for me. I mean, I went quite a ways up, but not as far up as I used to go. Um, so anyway, 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz is the range. Usually, we actually don't start hearing things until around 50 hertz. Um, 20 hertz is very low. It'd have to be very loud. Um, and even then, it's more of like a feeling it in your chest than it is of actually hearing it. But around 50 um, is a place where you definitely can hear something it might be very low like an ultra low rumble but it's something that you can hear and 20,000 hertz man I mean if you're not like I'd say if you're older than 14 you've probably already lost 20,000 hertz so um, unfortunately um, okay so we have different um, ranges of hearing for adults and uh, very young children and what that means is that very young children, babies and uh, toddlers, um, actually can hear much better than we can. You already start losing some stuff um, after that. So um, let's take a look at what these are. I should explain what we're looking at here first. So over here, this is our uh, adult range. No, I'm sorry. Our adults are over here on the right. Um, so this is how loud a sound needs to be for you to tell that it's there. And this is the frequency of the sound. So 500 hertz, 
Um, if you only need it to be 10 decibels and you can hear a 500 hertz tone, that's okay. You're within the range of normal hearing. So let's say you go up and you test at 2000 hertz and maybe you need to be at 20 decibels to hear 2000 hertz. You need whatever tone you're listening to, 20,000 hertz tone, to be played at uh, 20 decibels. That's still within the range of normal hearing. Right here, there, popped up again, right there. Now let's say that you go to 4,000 hertz, and what if you need it to be at 40 decibels to hear that? Well, then that's considered mild hearing loss uh, for 4,000 hertz. Now over here for children, we know that they should have better hearing than we do, which means that they have this additional category of slight hearing loss. So if we were to test a you know, really young child, um, 500 hertz, and it only needed to be amplified by 10 decibels for them to hear it, uh, that's fine. That's normal hearing. So we move up to 2,000, and they need it at 20 decibels to hear. That's considered slight hearing loss. It was normal for adults, but it's slight hearing loss for children. Uh, and then, of course, 4,000 hertz, if you need it at 40, that's still considered mild hearing loss in both adults and children. Uh, so it's not, I guess, necessarily that um, every level is different between adults and children. It's actually just that we've added something. We've added slight hearing loss between 15 and 25 uh, decibels. That's considered slight hearing loss. And again, the reason for that is because babies and young children should have absolutely optimal hearing. They haven't heard enough sounds uh, like we have to start damaging their hearing. So they should be able to hear all of these frequencies uh, at or below 15 hertz. But once you hit, you know, um, slightly older childhood, you know, probably 10, 12, uh, around there, and all the way up into adulthood, well then we know that there's going to be some age-related hearing loss and um, you should only need amplification at or below 20 decibels. Anything above that is mild. Anything above 40 is moderate. Anything above six, uh, 55 is moderately severe. Anything above 70 is severe. And then anything above 90 is profound hearing loss. You're going to see these uh, graphs again, because what we're going to start doing is we're going to start um, marking on these graphs where someone can actually hear that there's a tone being presented to them. You've probably gone through this when you were in school, right? So you'd put on headphones and you'd hear boop and you'd have to raise your hand, beep and you'd have to raise your hand. And uh, what they're looking for is, can you hear this? And if you can, do you know that it's on the right side? And so if you don't do anything, then they assume that you ha didn't hear that. So they'll have to turn up the uh, how loud it's presented, turn up the intensity of the sound, and see if you can hear it then. Um, once we start marking people's responses, this is called an audiogram. And we're going to take a look at one of those um, right now. So what you've got here is an audiogram. Um, we have a right ear is represented by uh, a circle, this red circle here. It's not always red and blue. Um, a lot of times both of them are just done in black ink, especially if you work in a place that's kind of skimping on their color ink. Um, but it is usually a circle for the right ear. Uh, and an X for the left ear. And the way that you can remember this is um, that it's OK if you're right-handed, but it's very weird if you're left-handed. Of course, I'm kidding. It's fine if you're left-handers. My best friend is a left-hander, um, <laughs> which um, he's a cool guy, so it's fine. But anyway. That's kind of how I remember it. Okay, if you use your right hand, 
It's weird if you use your left hand. That's my device for remembering this. So anyway, right ear is a circle, left ear is an X. And what we've done here is we're plotting out uh, where this person can actually hear tones um, based on you know how intense they are. So um, as we're playing a 250 hertz sine wave to this person, they couldn't hear it with 10 de decibels of amplification. They couldn't hear it with 20 decibels of amplification. In their left ear, they could hear it with 30. In the right ear, they could hear it with 35. Um, at 500 hertz, uh, with their left ear, they could hear it at 25, with their right ear at 35. And then you can see that as we get to, say, 2,000, um, in their right ear, they can hear this 2,000 hertz tone at 10 decibels, and in their left ear, it's at 15 decibels. And so here's my question to you. At 3,000 hertz, is there hearing loss? And what type of hearing loss is that? Think it over for one second. Well, the answer is no. That's not considered hearing loss. Because they can hear a 300 hertz tone in both ears at or below 20 hertz. Um, and so if we jump back here, we can see that at or below 20 hertz is normal hearing. We're assuming this is an adult. If it was a child, let's see, we're at 10. If it's a child, it, it's still okay. It's at 10 and 15. So even if this was a child, this wouldn't be considered hearing loss at 3,000 hertz. At 250 hertz, you can see that there is uh, some hearing loss. It doesn't, it, adult or child, um, this is definitely some hearing loss because it's at and above 30 decibels uh, that this person needs to be able to hear a 250 hertz tone. And if we jump back, we see that 30 decibels is mild hearing loss in both cases, adult or child. Um, so there is hearing loss in the low frequency, which is unusual. Um, typically we see high frequency hearing loss. But this looks like uh, this person has hearing loss to about maybe 2,000 hertz, below 2,000 hertz, they've got some hearing loss, and beyond that it looks uh, pretty much okay. So there are three types of hearing loss. The first is conductive. Conductive hearing loss means that sounds that are coming in are dampened before they get to the inner ear. So it's a middle ear problem, it's an outer ear problem, um, and usually these can be cured. Um, if, if you see somebody with conductive hearing loss, it's likely that something can be done to clear that up. Sensory neural hearing loss, this is where we have problems with the inner ear. Um, with the hair cells, there's actual cell death uh, and, and you know the hair cells are gone. Um, or perhaps there is a problem with the, uh, the nerve, the eighth cranial nerve. There can be infections or tumors that grow on the nerve. Uh, this can pose a problem there as well. Um, and then of course there can be problems with the brain, with the auditory cortex as well. Um, these are less likely to be cured. It's, uh, you can't regrow hair cells, which we talked about. You can take tumors out, but a lot of times if these are um, growing on the nerve, it's dicey. The nerve is probably going to be severed, and then you've lost all hearing. Um, and then, of course, problems with the brain. We know when we talk about um, other types of like neurogenic disorders, the brain is a complicated system. It's difficult to work on, it's difficult to see where the problems are, and it's very difficult to actually heal these problems as well. So if there's something wrong with the auditory cortex, it's unlikely it will be able to um, cure that. Uh, there can also be mixed hearing loss, and all that means is that you have conductive and sensory neural hearing loss. I really quickly want to mention, just in case I forget to say this later, that conductive hearing loss doesn't usually distort the sound signal, it's just muffled. Uh, sensory neural hearing loss can actually distort the sound signal. And the reason for this is different frequencies can be 
uh, impacted differently. Um, there can be noise in the signal. Uh, I mean, you can think of it like masking from uh, static noise, sort of, uh, because it, it kind of is. Uh, if there's a tumor or something growing on the nerve, on the eighth cranial nerve, it can produce um, strange uh, auditory sensations, which can uh, mask sounds that you're actually hearing. So there's a lot of distortion that comes with sensory neural hearing loss. Or, or you're not even hearing a good portion of what someone's saying. So like, um, my dad doesn't understand what I'm saying all the time. That's because he has terrible high frequency hearing loss. Um, and it's really distorting the signal. He's not hearing everything. With conductive hearing loss, you get everything. It's just all reduced in how loud it seems like it is uh, by the time it gets to your um, to your brain, I guess. That's when you notice it. All right, so we can tell the difference between conductive, sensory neural, and mixed hearing loss just by looking at uh, these audiograms. So. Remember, uh, the right ear is represented by a circle. The left ear is represented by an X. But then you probably see on here that we have uh, something else going on. Um, it's a C or a less than and a greater than sign. And what this is showing you is bone conduction. So air conduction, typical hearing, is a circle or an X. Uh, and then these less than and greater than signs, these are bone conduction. Uh, if you look at it, you notice that for the right ear, um, it has two lines, two, two end points of the line on the right side. And so it's a less than sign. And for the left, it has two end points of the line on the left side. So that's an easy way to tell them apart. Also, they should be paired up with their uh, counterpart, the O or the X. So if we look at conductive, what we see is that the bone conduction is totally fine. Bone conduction, by the way, let me grab my cool prop, which is my tuning fork. Um, so bone conduction just means that you're not hearing with your you're not using the tympanic membrane. You're not using the auditory meatus or any of that. There's actually no sound pressure wave that's traveling um, through your outer and middle ears when you're listening to bone conduction. What's happening is your bone is vibrating. Something's vibrating and it's being touched to your skull. And that actually makes uh, the fluid in the cochlea vibrate. Um, and so then that produces uh, a sound just like it would if you were actually hearing it the typical way with, um, you know, a sound pressure wave hitting your tympanic membrane. Um, so this is a tuning fork. And what's really cool is my microphone actually can do a form of bone conduction. Uh, so let's try this out really quickly. I'm going to have to hit this against my knuckle really hard. So this is air conduction. You know what, let me, let me move my um, microphone up so you can actually see this. Okay, here's my microphone. So this is air conduction. I'm just holding it above the microphone. And you can hear the tuning fork because it's vibrating the air. It's creating a sound pressure wave, which is then traveling to the microphone. And um, that sound is pushing on a diaphragm that's inside the microphone. Um, and it's causing it to vibrate. And that's connected to a few wires. And what they're doing is they're, um, they're kind of magnetized. So as the diaphragm gets pushed down towards the wires, there's a higher voltage. And as it moves away there's a lower voltage so then the microphone actually the computer is um, turning that difference in voltage into sound um, 
So that's air conduction. Now watch this. I'm going to hold it here. And you can't really hear anything. But when I touch it, you can. Okay, so let me let me do that again. Not hearing anything. Definitely hearing something. So that's bone conduction. What's going on now is this is still vibrating, but uh, it's not loud enough to vibrate the air to get all the way to the microphone. I have to hold this really close to the microphone for you to be able to hear it. So if I go down here, I can even do this. I think I can do it on the stand. Ow. Yeah, well, it sort of works, but there we go. So this is all the way down here. Cool, right? So now what's going on, this is a lot like bone conduction, is this is vibrating, but it's not the sound pressure wave that's getting to the diaphragm in here. What's happening is this vibration is vibrating this entire stand, which is then vibrating everything inside the microphone, including the diaphragm inside the microphone. In this case, the diaphragm of the microphone is a lot like your cochlea. So when we do bone conduction, uh, we use headphones or we use tuning forks or whatever. It's usually, it's, I mean, we're not in the 1800s, so it's, it's not tuning forks. I should not say that. <laughs> um, but we use bone conduction headphones, and they just kind of latch on to the um, mastoid process back here. Um, which is right right behind your ear right here and uh, you can hear really well with those bone conduction headphones so anyway with conductive hearing loss um, bone conduction works fine because the problem is with the outer and middle ear let's say you have a bunch of earwax in your ear uh, and of course, the sound pressure wave is going to come in through the ear canal and it's going to be dampened by all the earwax in your ear. And it's not going to move the tympanic membrane as much as it should because there's a ton of earwax between the tympanic membrane and the sound pressure wave. However, if you use bone conduction and bypass the outer and middle ear, then you can hear just fine because nothing's wrong with your hair cells if you have an ear full of wax. So what you see is this up here. Remember, bone conduction is the greater than and less than signs, and we see that zero decibels of amplification is needed. That's amazing. Here it's only five, it's perfect. Zero, five, zero. No hearing loss at all. This is picture perfect hearing. But when the person is listening through headphones, there is mild hearing loss, mild hearing loss, mild hearing loss, only at 3,000 hertz do they actually have no hearing loss. Then back to mild and mild. Uh, this is conductive hearing loss. Rule of thumb, you're going to see a separation for conductive hearing loss. The top level is not going to have any sort of hearing loss at all. And then there's going to be another group that's separated down below them in some way. Sensory neural hearing loss is all about either the nerve or the hair cells or the brain. And that means that it doesn't matter if you're getting bone conduction coming through the bones, bypassing the outer and middle, because it's still going to the inner, or a typical air conduction, which is going to be a sound pressure wave coming through the outer and middle ear. Everything's going through the inner ear. So you would expect to see that bone conduction and typical air conduction are in the same place because you're not bypassing the problem. So the rule of thumb here is there's no separation between the two lines. They're right on top of each other. And there's hearing loss, obviously. If the two are right on top of each other and there's no hearing loss, then there's just no hearing loss. But if there is hearing loss and they're together, that's sensory neural. And then you can have mixed. What mixed means is there is some degree of sensory neural hearing loss. So you take both of those 
and you shift them down, there's something wrong with the hair cells or the brain. Uh, but then there's also conductive hearing loss. So you also have the wax, which means then the air conduction is going to fall down even further. So everything comes down because of sensory neural hearing loss and then conductive hearing loss is going to come down even further. So remember, the rule of thumb for conductive was two uh, individual lines. There's a separation between the lines. That's going to pinpoint, that it should point out to you that there is conductive hearing loss. And in mixed, you're going to see this as well, except that they're going to be shifted down. In conductive hearing loss, the top line should be up in normal hearing. In mixed hearing loss, then the top line is still going to be down below normal hearing, and the, uh, con the uh, air conduction is going to be even lower than that. All right, I think you probably got that. Now let's talk about different kinds of conductive hearing loss. I mean, one of the major things uh, that if you go into audiology, you, you'll definitely see cases of people with crap in their ear canal. It could be wax. A lot of times it's wax. Uh, it could be M&Ms. That may or may not be autobiographical. Um, it wasn't... I was involved with the M&Ms, but it wasn't my ear. Um, it was a... Anyway. Um, could be tumors. Not tumors on the nerve, which we talked about. This would be a tumor in, say, the outer ear or the middle ear. Um, and then also congenital abnormalities. Uh, just a strangely formed ear from birth uh, can cause conductive hearing loss. This picture right here is from a YouTube video of this person had like 27 objects stuck in their ear. I don't know what they are. And the video was basically just you watched all of them be taken out. And, uh, and it was gross. But a lot of it got a lot of hits. Like there were tons of thumbs up. So if you if you want to see it, it's do I have a link to it here? No, I didn't link to it. Uh, I guess you can look it up, I guess. Conductive hearing loss is also caused by um, infection and swelling. So you can have sometimes just scratches inside your ear, um, which will then swell up uh, if they maybe got slightly infected or they're just a bad scratch. Sometimes bad scratches swell up. Um, and that can cause a little bit of uh, hearing loss temporarily. In fact, you can actually get um, acne inside your ear. And that can cause a little bit of swelling that causes temporary conductive hearing loss. Um, and then external otitis, that's just an, uh, um, like swimmer's ear, just some sort of infection, right? So you have swimmer's ear, um, there's some swelling in the outer ear, and, uh, and it's fine. Like I said, you just get some drops, you put it in, usually you're better in, in a week. And so all of these are pretty curable. Tumors can be taken off. Congenital abnormalities can be fixed with plastic surgery. Wax and M&Ms can be removed. Uh, scratches can heal. And external otitis can be cured. Um, the middle ear is a little bit more touchy, but these can also be cured, usually. Um, like I said, it's a little more tricky. Um, these, like the problems in the external ear, can be caused by infection and swelling. But like we talked about in one of the previous lectures, middle ear infections are a little more dicey than external ear infections. These are called otitis media. That's the uh, name that your doctor might write on your chart if you came in with a middle ear infection. Um, a lot of times you have to take antibiotic pills for these. You can't just do drops. Uh, the reason why you can't do drops is because you have a tympanic membrane in the way. The drops aren't going to go anywhere. That's why you have to take uh, oral antibiotics. That's also why they're a little dicier. They're harder to treat because you can't just put an antibiotic directly on the problem. You have to take a pill for it. You can also have obstructed eustachian tubes. So this is what happens when you're going up to, like, let's say, Flagstaff. If you're one of my students that don't live in the valley, 
which actually is most of you. Um, anytime you're on a plane, uh, you're driving from the mountains to uh, not the mountains. I was going to say the desert, but that doesn't exist in most places. Um, but let's just go with it. So you're driving from the mountains to the desert or the desert to the mountains. You're going to have to yawn to pop your ears. Well, this is your eustachian tube equalizing the pressure that's inside the middle ear and the outside uh, environment. Um, so usually this is blocked. You know, it's 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 kind of it's kind of closed. What you have to do is yawn to open this little passageway, and then that allows the air, the air pressure, to equalize between the two. Um, that's typical. If you have an obstructed eustachian tube, that can be dangerous because if the eustachian tube is obstructed, pressure changes can build up. If, like, let's say you're driving from the desert to the mountains and you have an obstructed eustachian tube, uh, the air inside the middle ear will begin to have <laughs> a greater volume and it won't be able to go anywhere. It's possible that this could end up rupturing the tympanic membrane, which is bad on two fronts. Number one, it's painful. Number two, actually it's bad on three fronts. It's painful. It can cause temporary hearing loss that is uh, quite um, severe because there's no tympanic membrane. And then three, it can actually cause permanent hearing loss um, the tympanic membrane will heal, but it'll never heal quite back the way it was. There's a lot of scar tissue involved, and that's going to take um, a lot more deflection. It's going to be thicker. Uh, it's a nice thin little membrane, uh, you know, the way it is. And if it gets damaged, it's much thicker, which then takes more force um, to cause it to deflect. And so then you are always going to have some form of conductive hearing loss if you have damage to the uh, tympanic membrane. One thing that can be done if you have chronic um, obstructed eustachian tubes, which again, a lot of times actually the obstructed eustachian tubes can be caused by an infection. Not always, but, some, but a lot of times. Um, is you can get these little, uh, it's like gauges put into your eardrum. And all this does is it acts like a pressure relief valve. So they make a very small incision in your tympanic membrane, but they, you know, they do it with a scalpel and they only do it just, just as much as they need to. Then they insert this little pressure relief valve. Um, and what this does is it prevents your tympanic membrane from blowing out from a pressure change. Um, and if you get to the point where you don't need this, that um, the slice from the scalpel will heal and not affect hear, he, hearing because it's such a small and precise cut. Um, if you've had surgery, you know that. Well, if you've had surgery and other injuries, you know that uh, scars don't form as largely from scalpel incisions. They're so sharp and so precise uh, that the skin is able to uh, come back together and uh, heal fairly well. Much different than if you fall on something and get a large ragged cut, which is the kind of thing that would happen if you ruptured your eardrum. Then you have a bigger, much more gnarly scar, uh, which is something you don't want in your tympanic membrane. Um, all right, so what about the ossicles? Sometimes you can have trauma um, that can break the ossicles. This happens a lot of times with car accidents. Um, and of course that can damage the hearing as well. Um, you can also have otosclerosis, which is an abnormal bone growth um, here on the stapes. So what ends up happening is the stapes gets kind of like glued on to the skull by excess bone. What can be done is um, there's a laser surgery can, that can go in and kind of 
get rid of that extra bone, the laser should be able to take it off and separate the two so that you have normal hearing. Another thing that can happen if, uh, if that laser surgery doesn't work is that the stapes has to be replaced with a prosthetic stapes, um, which, is, which is interesting. Uh, but it works really well. Um, occasionally they have to be changed depending on how old you are and how old you become. Um, they can, you know, begin to break down, uh, which we know about um, artificial hips as well. Sometimes they, and knees, they occasionally need to be replaced, um, and these do too. But it works really well um, as a stapes. Okay, well, what about sensory neural hearing loss? Uh, like we said, hair cell damage or disorders to the hair cell um, can definitely cause sensory neural hearing loss. Fetal alcohol syndrome is something that can uh, cause disordered uh, growth of the hair cells. Um, in addition to that, you can also have auditory processing deficits so that it can actually affect the auditory cortex of the brain. There's also ototoxic drugs. Ototoxic just means toxic to the ear, oto ear, like otolaryngologist, uh, toxic, toxic. Um, so really high doses of aspirin are ototoxic. Uh, but some antibiotics are ototoxic, um, some diuretic drugs are, uh, and some chemo drugs are. So these can all damage the hair cells just from taking the drug. Um, of course, we know about loud noises and aging. Um, and if you look over on the right, this is definitely not the first time you're going to see, or <laughs> this is definitely not the last time you'll see this. You'll probably see it in most of your audiology classes. Um, this is showing you when sound can be dangerous. Um, and if you look at this, about 85 is when you can, 85 decibels is where you're going to start to have um, damage to your hearing. Now, if you look at what that means, um, 70 decibels is a washing machine and 80 decibels is traffic noise inside a car. So if you're turning your radio up loud enough to be heard over the traffic noise inside your car, you might already be at the level of damaging your hearing. Um, a sporting event, 14 minutes, and then you're probably going to experience some sort of hearing damage. A rock concert, about two minutes. And then a siren, a jet engine, other things like this, less than a minute. Any exposure uh, to jet engines at some proximities, not in the plane, but out of the plane, any exposure, depending on how close you are, can damage hearing. Um, okay, so aside from the hair cells, we can also have tumors of the eighth cranial nerve. And here's one of these. This is called an acoustic neuroma, and that just means that it's growing on the acoustic nerve. It's a tumor. It's usually a non-cancerous tumor, but um, I mean, that's, that's good because it's not gonna move anywhere else, but it's not great because it's still growing on the auditory nerve. And as we talked about before, we can remove tumors, but it's so close to the auditory nerve that it's likely that the surgery will either not get all of the tumor and so it can grow back, or if the surgery gets all of the tumor, it may be cutting into the auditory nerve. The tumor also may be growing in such a way that it's growing around different nerve, uh, auditory nerve bundles. And so cutting it out will necessitate cutting some of the nerve bundles. Uh, so that usually ends up um, with either hearing loss, if the tumor grows and doesn't continue growing, it can be left, and then there's some sort of uh, hearing distortion or slight hearing loss. If it has to be taken out and the auditory nerve is cut, then it's complete hearing loss. Well, there can also be neural problems too. TBI, certain types of TBI, certain types of stroke can take out of the auditory center of the brain. And that can lead to either auditory processing problems or hearing loss altogether. 
Um, this is what you would expect from typical age-related hearing loss. You have fine, low frequency resolution, and then it starts to taper off into your higher frequencies. That's just what you'll expect to see. So if you're one of my students that wants to go into audiology, this is something that you'll probably see quite often. Um, oh yeah, okay, we've only got two slides to get through here. So there's different ways that we can measure these. Um, we can use pure tones. This is the one that you probably had in school. Boop. And you raise your hand. Um, or you can use speech. So you'll also use a computer to present these, but instead of a beep, um, you'll have words. So dog, and you raise your hand. Dog, and you raise your hand. Um, so again, that's pure tone and speech. Uh, you'd use speech because it's a little bit more like what people do in the real world. Um, we're usually not attending to just one specific pure tone sine wave. Um, but that was the old way that we did it because we could have computers that created pure tones. Um, you know, in the 90s, they could carry just this smaller computer around and set it up. Of course, now we've got laptops, so we can use speech audiometry um, in, you know, much more mobile settings than we used to be able to. Um, normal hearing and conductive loss have the highest word recognition scores. So if you're using speech audiometry, you're going to expect that, um, well, normal hearing, of course, they're going to have high word recognition scores because there's no problem there. But conductive loss, they're going to have high recognition scores because there's no distortion. Remember, it's just an M&M &M in the ear, uh, so it's kind of dampening all the sounds, but it's not changing how the sounds go together exactly. So you should still have high word recognition score. Sensory neural hearing loss, uh, even if you think about age-related hearing loss, you're cutting out all the high frequency components of what you're hearing. And that can distort the signal. If you have static in the signal from an acoustic neuroma, that can definitely distort the signal. And so you won't have good word recognition scores, even though you may be able to hear pure tones. So using speech audiometry is also a way to look for sensory neural versus conductive hearing loss. Uh, and then lastly, we can also measure how much uh, tympanic membrane deflection there is. Remember, our tensor tympani muscle uh, is going to work uh, anytime we hear loud sounds. So we can look at the degree that the membrane is being deflected just by regular sound, the, mem the degree that the membrane is being affected by a uh, slight tensing of the tensor tympani muscle, um, to get an idea of uh, the middle ear processes. And the reason for that is um, if there is something going on uh, like an obstructed uh, eustachian tube, you would expect that that buildup of pressure doesn't allow the tympanic membrane to deflect as much as it should. So you can use tympanometry in conjunction with a, uh, a bone conduction hearing test, either pure tone or speech, uh, to kind of get at the root of the problem. You can see if it's an outer problem, a middle problem, or an inner ear problem, just by using these techniques. Uh, and then here's something really cool that I did research on. Um, this is just showing by using tympanic deflection um, that we proved that we actually used the tensor tympani and stapedius muscles to tune out things that we're not listening to. So what we did was we put the little tympanometer into the ear and uh, we had people, we put it in there, let's say we put it in the right ear. We had people either listen to uh, words that were coming in on the left and write the first letter of them or listen to words that were coming in on the right and write the first letter. And what you see here is um, experimental is here and baseline is here. So baseline is just saying this is when they're not listening to the words on that side. Um, 
and this is when they are listening for words on that side. So if we're measuring the right ear, this is when the words that they need to listen to are in the right ear, and this is when the words are on the other ear. And so what you see is um, it takes a louder sound to be able to, um, you know, deflect the, the tympanic membrane. So there's more muscular contraction uh, when in the ear that we're not attending to because we're attending to something else. So this actually means that there's some sort of physical uh, tuning out that happens when you're listening to the other side. Well, this is pretty crazy because we uh, there's always there's been a debate about whether or not um, we have muscular control over things that far out away from the brain uh, in the hearing system and like the visual system. Like, can we really cause consciously cause the uh well it's it's not exactly consciously it's kind of unconsciously it's an it's an intentional unconscious thing but it's related to attention to our conscious attention so can our conscious attention actually change things as far out as the middle ear and this shows that it can which is really really interesting um okay that's the end of this lecture um let's see what are we talking about next uh i think we're talking about device management of hearing loss no the next thing you're going to watch is about um what is it about uh hearing amplification and uh hearing assistance and also deaf culture all right i will talk to you soon